Britain had the jet. And with our next big jet-powered aircraft of the 50s, it looked as if we would land the killer blow. Britain's aircraft industry may have a winner in the Comet. I quote the sober view of aviation critics. The de Havilland Company have produced this four-engine jet airliner, the first in the world, largely from experiments carried out on the little 108. Their pilots are the famous war ace Cunningham and Johnny Wilson. Cunningham talks to Sir Frank Whittle on the left, the inventor of the jet. No airliner came close to the Comet's beauty or speed. The distinctive whistle of its ghost engines thrilling the crowd wherever it went. It was a jetliner that could travel twice as high and twice as fast as anything else. Smooth and high above the weather, it was a transport of delight. And at least five years ahead of anything proposed by our rivals. It was the shape of things to come. Suddenly, out of very often things which are little more than sheds and garages and some fairly run-down buildings, people have conceived the future, a completely new way of flying and a completely new way of looking at aeroplanes. What struck me about it was you looked at this magnificent silver aircraft and you looked at the surroundings of the silver aircraft, which are chaps in cloth caps, ancient movie cameras trying to film this plane. In the middle of it is something which is utterly timeless. To make the vision reality, de Havilland needed sales in volume. And that meant getting the backing of the state-funded British Overseas Airways Corporation. Only they could guarantee the Comet's success. There were plenty of reasons for caution. For one thing, air routes all over the world were only equipped to handle aeroplanes travelling about half the speed and half the height of the Comet. Of course there were plenty of reasons for caution but get sufficient numbers of the new aircraft into service quickly and Britain might, at one stroke, find herself years ahead of her competitors. Order them now. The comet was stunning when it first emerged. It had been kept secret, really under wartime levels of secrecy, until it rolled out in July 1949. And then, of course, it caused a sensation. It was so new, so sleek, so silver, so beautiful. The comet, with its signature square windows and rakishly swept wings, shrank the globe. The first four-jet airliner, Britain's already famous comet, made worldwide news by its astonishing flight to North Africa and back. This wonderful machine's total time in the air for the distance of just under 3,000 miles was a mere six hours, 38 minutes. De Havilland's test pilot, John Cunningham, was the quintessential company man always facing every interview with a broad, innocent smile. And it gave us an average speed from takeoff to flying over the airfield at the other end of about 450 miles an hour. London to Copenhagen in one hour, 18 minutes. The newspapers of the time, free of any doubt, proclaimed the comet as a world beater. Karachi, flying time, 10 hours, 21 minutes. It was at a time when I went off to interview John Cunningham. He told me that soon after he first flew it, a test pilot from Lockheed, and Lockheed at that time was one of the principal American uh, aircraft manufacturers, Cunningham took that top Lockheed pilot up in the Comet to about 30,000 feet. The Lockheed pilot was completely blown away by it. He said, I cannot believe this plane. This is unbelievable. And it was. It represented the future. And for a country which had run out of money, which Britain had at the end of the 40s, uh, a country whose achievements were vast and largely in the past, and whose present was one of being in hock to the Americans forevermore, this suddenly seemed to represent a get out of austerity easily. And that, I think, is one of the reasons why the comet was so important then. I remember going to Heathrow, dragging my mother to Heathrow uh, to see the Comet Ones when uh, the old north side passenger terminals were just canvas tents mostly. And then this wonderful silver apparition with the BOAC markings whining as it rolled by. This great howl, really, from the ghost engines. It took your breath away. It was so lovely, so smooth. Terrific. Sir Miles Thomas, chairman of BOAC, greeted the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh at London's British Industries Fair. 
Royal attention focused on a scale model comet, for only a few days before, this record-breaking aircraft had again made the front pages by going into regular service as the world's first passenger-carrying jet airline. The comet's first scheduled service was the airmail run, down to Rome and on to Africa and the dominions of the Empire, to set down finally in Johannesburg. In London operations room, news of the comet's landing was flashed from Rome. What time did you arrive there in the room? Around 15.33. 15.33, one minute late. Could you be putting up the mountain, please? Yes, certainly. As we approached Entebbe, we saw Lake Victoria beneath us, a 200-mile stretch of shimmering water right at the end of the runway. Before we reached Livingstone, Captain Marsden came in to see how we were getting along. Maybe a bit turbulent. They don't guarantee it every time, you know. Try. And even as I was searching my mind for the right words to describe this completely new experience in flying, our destination came into view. And below us lay the great blocks of city buildings and the golden slag heaps of the Rand. The roots of empire were, were still vital. Yes, the writing was on the wall. It was clearly going to be axed slowly or quickly. Nobody quite knew then. I mean, India had already gone in 47. But we had large areas of the planet to control and military to get out there and to service and civil servants and all the rest of it. So right to the Far East, right down to, uh, to the south, southern tip of Africa, um, we had to preserve air routes. Orders started to pour in from Air France, Air India, Japan, Venezuela and Brazil, and even from the United States. But then curious accidents started to happen that had not featured during Cunningham's testing. This is the comet that barely landed on Rome's Ciampino airfield at its takeoff. Not one of the 36 passengers or crew of six was hurt a fact that reflects great credit on the jet airliner as well as on the coolness and skill of its pilot. The design of the comet's wings appeared vulnerable to stalling on takeoff, a problem known as over-rotation. The pilots could actually raise the nose of the aircraft too high on takeoff, which disturbed the airflow into the engine. It dropped its efficiency. It also disturbed the airflow over the wings, and that killed the lift. Conversely, if you didn't rotate enough, you just never took off at all. You just remained in ground effect. So um, it was very tricky. John Cunningham, who was one of the finest test pilots in the world, he knew the airplane so well that he never, never got himself into an over-rotate position. But on a dark, rainy night, which uh, airline pilots work in, uh, test pilots very rarely do, uh, the situation is quite different. The first accident seemed like straightforward pilot error. But then one of Ron McDonald's Canadian friends, Captain Charles Pentland, crashed on takeoff in Karachi, killing all on board. Everybody thought that, you know, Charlie was the one man that would never get himself into this situation. Unfortunately, over-rotation occurred and the aircraft never left the ground. It just went off the runway and blew up and killed everybody. Uh, so it was... Partly, maybe the instrumentation didn't give you the, the degrees of, of pitch that you required, which uh, we had on, on later aircraft. The real problem with the Comet was that, being a jet aircraft, it was much less forgiving um, than propeller-driven aircraft, part, uh, mostly because you, you don't have the slipstream going back over the control surfaces until it's already reached quite a fast speed. Um, and and they, the problem is that all the people who flew it and all the people who maintained it were still thinking vaguely of the propeller era. They, weren't, they didn't realise that the jet era was something totally different. 
While de Havilland set about addressing the problems of the comet, their competitors, Bristol, had come up with an aircraft to challenge the Americans on the transatlantic routes. Bristol needed fuel efficiency, so they chose the turboprop. This new aircraft they called the Britannia. The age of the second Elizabeth, bringing with it draftsmanship that leads the designs of the world. The Bristol Britannia was actually a rather beautiful looking plane. It was also, in theory, a plane the world needed. It was a turboprop, but it was quite fast, 350, 400 miles an hour. It could deliver quite a lot of passengers and it could deliver them over quite a long distance. So in some ways, at that time, it seemed from a British standpoint, really quite a good idea. The Britannia, the airliner of tomorrow. The plane's first public appearance had been at Farnborough in September 1952. The test pilot was the vastly experienced Bill Pegg, the man who had first flown the ill-fated Brabazon. A lovely, graceful machine. Her evolution ranks as a milestone equal to the regular services of the Comte. Spectators were astounded at the quietness of the plane, and it was soon nicknamed the Whispering Giant. Forerunner of a fleet on order for the British Overseas Airways Corporation was the star of the show, the 100-seater Bristol Britannia turboprop airliner. The Britannia gave a striking foretaste of the future in a year of aviation history. But here, too, problems started to appear. There were persistent teething faults with the Bristol Proteus engines. Bill Pegg, who was Bristol's chief test pilot, was showing some KLM people, potential customers, um, how the Britannia worked and all the rest of it, and took them off for a flight from Filton and flew them up over South Wales. And at one point, one of the engines developed a very serious fault and caught fire. Eventually, the entire wing was in flames, and knowing that there were 2,000 gallons of fuel in it, um, Bill Pegg was a little alarmed about this, and I think the KLM people were too. Um, obviously, you couldn't do a crash landing there in the mountains of Wales. My father was sitting in the back with one of the KLM personnel. The other one was in the right-hand seat, with Pegg in the left-hand seat. I would rather not refer to as a terrible crash in the River Severn of the Britannia in February 1954. It in fact was a controlled force landing after an engine fire developed in number three. And uh, the fire had been raging for about 20 minutes and they were quietly working out how long the structural integrity and the systems would continue to operate on the starboard wing. What they were frightened of, of course, was that the fire would be so intense because it was fanned by the slipstream that it would actually start melting the main spar, at which point, of course, the whole wing folds up. They would be, a whole lot of them would die. So he had to get to the ground as quickly as possible. And over the seven, could see in the estuary that the tide was out. He landed on the mudflat and they slid about 400 yards and then just turned slightly towards the sea and came to a halt. And the fire was out because the engines had inhaled so much mud it had actually stopped the fire. Everybody came out and perfectly un unscathed and all the rest of it and congratulated Bill Pegg. There was relief when they got out, but that's about it. <laughs> I have to say that KLM did not buy the aircraft. Meanwhile, for the Comet, the world's only jetliner, things had gone from bad to much worse. This is the tragic scene of the Comet disaster near Calcutta. Wreckage of the aircraft smashed almost beyond recognition. At the time of this terrible accident, the aircraft carried 37 passengers and a crew of six. All lost their lives. The reputation of the world's most celebrated aircraft now hung in the balance. Now, there's a curious tone in the British press at this time. You'll find people... It almost seems to come over that uh, it's your patriotic duty to fly in a comet. You know, and there are articles in which they suggest the plane may be sabotaged. Within six weeks, with typical British aplomb, Two plucky royals were dispatched to Rhodesia on, of course, a comet. The Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh were at London Airport only a few hours after their return from Scotland to see Queen Elizabeth the Queen Mother and Princess Margaret off on their flight to southern Rhodesia. And then tragedy struck on a grand scale. In January 1954 and then again in April, two comets fell from the skies into the Mediterranean killing all crew and passengers. 
The first had been the very plane that had set records on that inaugural flight to Johannesburg. 35 people were on board, including 10 children, and there were no survivors. It was imperative that the cause of the disaster should be known. Underwater television cameras built by scientists and technicians in a matter of a few days were rushed to the scene and operated by the Royal Navy. The wrecked aircraft was located and salvage operations began. Brought ashore too were the infinitely moving reminders of those whose lives were lost in this disaster of the air. When I was at school, I must have been about 11 or 12, I received an airmail letter from my uncle who was then in Hong Kong. And it was almost illegible because of the, it was all water stained and the address had run and everything. And it turned out that it had been on one of the comets that had crashed in the Mediterranean. And it was one of the letters that they'd managed to fish out and actually deliver. Um, it was very strange, it was slightly uncanny, slightly spooky, which I think is probably why I never actually kept it. The comet fleet was immediately grounded pending a full-scale investigation all foreign orders were cancelled. Barely a year after the fanfares, it seemed as if the last post had sounded for the comet. At the Royal Aircraft Establishment at Farnborough, they pieced together the remains of the wreckage and forensically analysed the results. This was the most painstaking and thorough safety examination in British aviation history. When the comet was grounded as a result of the accident, they had really no idea as to why, because of course there were no black boxes or anything like that in those days. So they took a comet fuselage down to Farnborough and subjected it to constant cycles of pressure in a water tank. After it had been filled, jacks beneath the wings caused a series of bumps as if in flight and internal pressure was raised in the fuselage. After the equivalent of 5,000 three-hour flights, metal fatigue resulted in cracks and breaks they discovered that a crack had formed um, in a commun communications aerial at the corner of it, up near the cockpit above it, and then it had spread along the corners of the windows. And of course it had all happened in an absolute split second. These key points of the comet's fuselage had been put under unbearable strain by repeated ascents and descents at high altitude. The comet's metal skin had failed just forward of its distinctive square windows. Then the cabin had exploded from the rapid decompression. And they did several um, slow motion films of a mock-up of this happening. And they realized that the sudden decompression, death would have been instantaneous for all the passengers. With seats being simply torn out and turned upside down, and the whole inside of the cabin becomes a complete maelstrom of bodies and seats and everything. And that would have happened in a fifth of a second less. Hindsight's always a wonderful thing, and it would be very easy for us to look back um, at the disasters the comet faced in the early 1950s and to say, well, we can see what was wrong. You know, it had oblong windows with square edges instead of circular windows or over windows. Of course, these would break up and there would be metal fatigue. And, well, what did people know then? They didn't know that. So we can be clever now. But um, remember, the Comet was brand new. It was a new type of aircraft, a very, very high-speed passenger jet. One had never been built before, but with new metals, new stress skins on aircraft. This is all new stuff. And the designers were entering a new dimension. Mistakes could be made. More than ever, Britain needed the turboprop Bristol Britannia to succeed. But engine icing problems and the new, more rigorous Air Ministry safety testing pushed the plane further and further behind schedule. This is called a drop test. The wheel is spun up and the whole assembly is then forced to the ground. In 1957, the Britannia finally made was former RAF pilot Norman Tebbit. Now Lord Tebbit. Good gracious me. It's a long time since I've been on one of these. A bit bigger than the old 100 series that I flew uh, this is the 300. 
I suppose it looks all very dated now with these old-fashioned luggage racks. Of course this again is the longer range version so they got a couple of bunks as they flew longer hauls across the North Atlantic and things of that kind and here onto the flight deck. Quite a nice navigator's station. Um, you could sit there quite comfortably out of everybody's way and of course here you've got the a hatch there and that's an escape hatch and here the hatch for the um, sextant, periscopic sextant because we navigated an awful lot in those days by Astro. The great thing about the Britannia was you needed a flight engineer fairly heavy who knew the location of all the um, switches and um, relays down in the hold underneath the flight deck here because this was before um, uh, smart modern electronics and everything was still electromechanical so if something stuck and didn't work got a good engineer he'd know which bit of the flight deck floor to jump up and down on to, to loosen things up um, and here you are and uh, I I was a co-pilot and a navigator on, on these things, so I'd be sitting up here somewhere. Oops! Gosh! Funny, not so easy to get into these seats as it was when I was young. And a slightly strange control column here, a sort of funny yoke, not terribly conventional. Big handful of throttles. This aeroplane was way ahead of the pack. It was the first really very, very electrical aeroplane. That had a downside, of course, in that if you lost the electrics, you were in real big trouble. That's when this switch came in. And basically it would disconnect all the generators and then reconnect them again. And you should get at least some of your electrical services back again. And of course, it was known inevitably as the Jesus Christ switch because uh, that was the only occasion when you'd use it at that moment when everybody on the flight deck was saying, Jesus Christ, and, and you'd grab it and hopefully all power would be restored. <laughs> Very useful. It seemed that nothing could stop the long-range turboprop Britannia from conquering the all-important North American market. Could the Union Jack fly high again over the good old US of A? Well, yes, if you believed Bristol's promotional film, but that was quite a big if. This is the Britannia, the largest, most up-to-date turboprop airliner in the world. Mr. Peter Maysfield, Managing Director of Bristol Aircraft Limited, heading a team of Bristol executives, engineers and technicians, introduced the Britannia to the major airline bases in 14 cities of America in an unprecedented 24,000-mile tour of the United States and Canada. This whispering giant from England is a real aeroplane. Yes, sir. I think the Britannia could have been a bigger seller if it had gone into service earlier. Uh, but partly it would have been limited by Bristol's own capacity to produce it in large numbers. Um, Howard Hughes was interested in ordering the Britannia for TWA. Uh, he actually flew it secretly uh, one, one morning on his own uh, after meeting Bristol's test pilots uh, out in America and came back and said that if he could have uh, 25 aeroplanes in 18 months or whatever it was, he'd order it on the spot for TWA. Uh, but Bristol were unable to commit to producing that because they didn't have the capacity. The tour was now over, and she returned to London Airport with the assurance that soon her sister ships in number would be following the trail she had so successfully blazed through the skies and across the oceans to the new world. Despite the fanfare, the order books told the story. In the end, there were no American orders. None. The idea was that you could build a very successful jet prop plane. Well, that's great, except that the Americans were thinking, we're going to get across the Atlantic in seven hours flat from London to New York. And the Bristol Britannia would kind of stumble its way there in about 12 hours. There have been some terrifying miscalculations. The Britannia was late 
and when she did get into service for the first year of her operation, only half of the aircraft arrived within an hour of their scheduled time. There was an all too public squabble between the BOAC and the Bristol company. The real problem was that the BOAC didn't want it, so they kept on bad mouthing it. BOAC actually sort of bigged up the, the safety issue of icing in the in the engines long after it had been solved and they were actually making this public. It was an extraordinary for an aircraft they were contracted to buy. BOAC didn't want the turboprop Britannia, they wanted a pure jet and an American one. They'd taken a shine to Boeing 707. The Americans had joined the jetliner race. Britain no longer had the skies to herself. Well, what chance do you think we have of capturing the world market for this long-range jet? The resources of the Americans, of course, are greater. Their jet aeroplanes are going to be backed up by big military contracts. I mean, Boeing's have already got a pretty big tanker contract for, for the 707. But despite that, I, I, I still think that we're capable of producing an aeroplane as good as they are. Well, now, why? What compensating advantage have we? Well, there's never any substitute for brains, even though it isn't supported by a great mass of equipment as it is over there. We, uh, we have this experience on, on the comet, for which again there is no substitute, right. and the comet clearly will become an aeroplane again and will work again. De Havilland's did indeed rise to the challenge. In October 1958, the new Comet 4 came into service to take on the Americans. She immediately became the first pure jetliner to cross the Atlantic. The redesign had thicker alloy for the fuselage and the vulnerable square windows were replaced by oval ones. Lord Ravison, at the public inquiry into the comet, you said, in every step in progress, we have had to pay for it in blood and in treasure. And God knows that in this case, we have paid in full. Do you still feel that way? Oh, I do indeed. It was a most expensive, but a very imaginative project, and we paid for it. But Good will come from it because on the back of our experience and on the back of what was learnt in that inquiry, other great machines in the world have been built and are flying today. The new comet was twice as large and twice as powerful with its Rolls-Royce Avon engines. The comet had pioneered jet travel and now defined an age. And your name? Lord Kimberley. Are you travelling for business or for pleasure? Uh, business. It's one of the smoothest flights I've been on, uh, far less tiring, and really is the tops. Well, I think it's wonderful because it's very silent, it's very quick, and you also get the most wonderful view. Why are you at all nervous about taking this flight? Oh, not at all. Not a bit. Why should I be? With government encouragement, BOAC did order 16 of the new planes, and other sales went to Asia, Africa, the Middle East, and South America. The Comet 4 was the definitive version of the most adventurous aircraft in all civil aviation history. As the late summers of the 50s came to an end, Britain's love affair with aircraft continued under Hampshire skies. It seemed that men in sheds could make the most improbable possible. And perhaps the most glorious of these was the fairy Rotodyne, a mongrel mix of autogyro and turbojet. It can go faster than a helicopter and slower than a fixed wing airplane. I think it's one of the most brilliant pieces of advanced engineering we've seen for a very long time. It is a new way of flying. Brilliant idea and it was well engineered, what they hadn't taken into account was the atrocious noise, the jets on the tips of the rotor. They could stop a conversation at two miles. I mean, it was intolerable. So, I mean, there was no way. It was a nice idea to have somebody flying you in from Heathrow to the South Bank or something. Very convenient for the city. But it was obviously just not possible to use the thing, so it was axed. And the industry, too, was becoming increasingly mismatched. The designs were brilliant and many, the sales were few. The government needed to step in to rationalise the business if it was to succeed. 
We were trying to cover all the different specifications on the military and civil sides. There were a large number of British firms and they were all too small. That's one of the reasons many of the aircraft were, were delayed. Uh, the teams weren't big enough to do the job. In a series of painful forced marriages, Rolls-Royce emerged as the leading engine manufacturer and the 20 aerospace companies were whittled down to two main groups, Hawker Siddeley and BAC, the British Aircraft Corporation. It would be down to BAC to mount the final British challenge to Boeing for the big jet market. It was Britain's final riposte to the brash Americans. It was powerful, Savile Row suited. The name was VC, VC-10. The VC-10 was a magnificent aircraft. There should be no question about that. It looks absolutely superb, whether you see it on film or in the tin. It's a delight. It's a piece of aviation sculpture. There's something thrilling in the way it took off, like a jet fighter rather than a, a lumbering Airbus of today. VC-10, romance in the sky, adventure, boy zone, dander, the eagle, all those things, utterly thrilling. The VC-10 does do a very different job to the Boeing. It's been designed to operate out of the short airfields with high temperature conditions, which are so important to large airlines like BOAC on the Commonwealth routes. Why was it necessary to come into this market at all? Well, the big jet market is um, a great part of the um, airline scene, and I think if we are to preserve the aircraft industry, which is a great national asset, uh, it um, exports perhaps 150 million pounds a year, we need to develop an aircraft like the VC-10. The last of the all-British great jets has to be the VC-10. And this was a final riposte to the Americans. They brought us the 707, which for decades was going to dominate aviation. We hit back with a plane which was much more sophisticated in its design. Well, the VC-10 looked wonderful. It had its engines at the back, so the cabin was supremely quiet. It was fast. In fact, I think it's still a world record holder for a subsonic airliner flight. So it was quick, it was comfortable, and it could go almost anywhere. In London every year, and uh, this is by far the most quiet and most comfortable one I can remember. The VC-10 was deeply loved by passengers and that was a great selling point. It's very seldom you get people coming off aircraft saying what a wonderful aircraft that was, but they really did on the VC-10. People would actually ask to fly on it and would postpone their flights if they couldn't. I think it's an extremely comfortable plane, very smooth, very quiet, the seating most comfortable and plenty of legroom. It seems to travel so serenely. When you hit um, turbulence it doesn't um, ride turbulence like other airliners. It has a very, very stiff wing, so it doesn't juggle you about like the average aircraft. And of course, the one major advantage the aeroplane always had and made it so successful was the fact that the engines were on the tail. So of course, consequently, it's a very quiet interior. Also, for a nervous person who doesn't really like flying, the aircraft could take off two-thirds quicker than a 707. So consequently, you're a thousand feet above the runway where the 707 was still sitting on it. The VC-10 was sold on its passenger experience, and part of this was down to the cabin crew. They also preferred the aircraft to the 707. When you compared it to the 707, which I also went on for a short period, it was the most amazing aircraft, the VC-10, because it was neat, it was small, it was very fast, and it was only 144 passengers, but uh, it was the latest jet plane, you know, that everyone was quite excited to fly in. The 707 was much noisier, and also the landing was... Well, I was thinking it was a controlled crash all the time. Bang, bang, bang mm. down the wrong way. Um, whereas the VC-10 was very smooth. It glided off and it glided down. It was very smooth. I think the passengers prefer the VC-10. The hostesses may have loved the aircraft, but were not always so keen on the designer uniforms. Favourite dresses were on this route. I'm sure it's New York down to the Caribbean. Yeah. And you were issued with this paper dress. So in New York, even if it was snowing, you trot onto the aircraft. We had these big raincoats, big sort of military raincoats. But when you took the raincoat off, you were wearing this paper dress. They're more or less all the same size. And they did up with string at the back. So if you only ha had any bust, it just stuck straight out in front. And they had to be, I think, two or three inches above the knee you were supposed to wear them. We were actually issued with tights then. 
And, of course, all the boys used to get the scissors out and try and cut them shorter and shorter. Green plastic shoes with plastic jewels on and a flower in your hair. Hideous. Horrendous. Hideous. And there's a row of three VC10s, and you don't know which one you're on. So you trot up the steps and say, are you going down the Caribbean? All shy and flustered. And, um, and then... Um, and they say, why? And you go like this, because you paper dress. No, no, it's not that one, do it? It's that one. <laughs> Yet once again, Britain was making a technically advanced aircraft to the specifications of one company. A company, BOAC, that was often referred to as the Boeing Only Aircraft Corporation. Such was its addiction to buying the Seattle jets. No British aircraft could succeed without the backing of the state airlines, and relying on that could be a pact with the devil. The BBC's Money Programme interviewed Britain's own Dr No, the chairman of BOAC. He damned the VC-10 with faint praise. It's uh, a lovely aeroplane to fly. I've, I've flown it myself. I think it has one little drawback, and that is that you have to get an awful lot of extra people in it before it makes money. It's a really sad story that BOAC, who specified the aeroplane, turned against it uh, when they realized that the 707 was actually more economical to fly. Uh, the reason it was more economical to fly was because uh, the 707 had been built for very long runways. The VC-10 had been designed specifically for BOAC's requirement to get out of shorter runways at high altitude in places like Nairobi uh, on the Empire routes. So it had a bigger wing with high lift devices and the tail mounted engines. Uh, this made it heavier and uh, therefore burned a bit more fuel. So BOAC uh, actually uh, tried to get out of a uh, part of their VC-10 order in order to buy more 707s, which didn't really help its image with the rest of the world when you're trying to sell it to other airlines. The airline corporations were more or less strong-armed into buying British. They had probably an excessive influence on the design of the aircraft because they were tailored for BOAC's needs, BEA's needs, without looking at the wider world as a market. So the aircraft were too closely tailored. And then, inevitably, minds changed, commerce developed, and the airlines didn't then really quite want what they'd said they wanted. And in the end, airlines tend to go for operating costs and reliability rather than the last bit of perfection. The American 707 went on to sell over a thousand. The British VC-10, a mere 54. A proud line of all British big jets to challenge the Americans had come to an end. And in 1966, the final sad twist. The Farnborough Air Show, so long the best of British, went international. For the first time, foreign aircraft are on show at Farnborough. Bristol Sydney powers four of them, an Orpheus engine in the Fiat Transonic jet trainer in Air Force service with Italy and Germany. The hard truth was that there were simply not enough British planes to fill our top show. Rolls-Royce is sponsoring three overseas aircraft. The Fokker Friendship with two Rolls Dart turboprops is an airliner from Holland. A wonderful creative age was drawing to a close. For so many years, Farnborough had been the showcase of British aviation, civil and military. The skies were full of the fastest and highest, the most menacing and the most adventurous. There was a great deal of very good design in Britain at that time, but in the end, we just simply didn't have the capacity, the people, the finances to do all the things that we were trying to do. Perhaps we were trying to do too many things and not really carry forward enough of them. It was so nearly a bloody great era, um, but it was screwed up by lousy management, hideously missed political decisions and also bad specification on the part of the airlines. But what is often overlooked is that we are still um, a major aerospace player. 
In fact, we're number one in Europe, and people don't realize that. We're second only to the United States in terms of aerospace. But, oh, there's some wonderful aircraft, the Comet. It should have been the greatest thing ever. And it, it, for two years, it was. Passengers thought it really was. The Americans themselves thought it had left them six years behind. Very sad. But, wow, there were some great aircraft. For two decades, we had ruled the skies and consistently broken records with amazing aircraft that were loved by crew and passengers alike. We had the first turboprop plane, the world-beating Vickers Viscount. The first jetliner, the sleek silver de Havilland Comet. And the VC-10, powerful and athletic and still an Atlantic record holder. In that golden age of invention and confidence, Britain had created magnificent planes, aircraft that changed the way that the world would fly forever. <laughs> 